Alex, uh, Brendan Kennedy, Toronto Star. Two questions on the Marlins trade. First, of the prospects you gave up, was there any one that was, that was tougher to let go of than the others? Any one that you're particularly worried about? And uh, regarding the players coming your way, I'm assuming you've spoken to all of them. Do you have any concern that there's any trouble with them coming to Toronto? There's some reports that came out that they were unhappy in the, the immediate aftermath of the trade. Sure. Um, uh, you end up being concerned about all of them, and that was, that's, that's the... Uh, Great part about you know your development and scouting staff and like, we we debated this trade in the office. It wasn't a unanimous decision. We had we had some people uh, in our management group that again they they were thrilled with the players we'd be acquiring back, but again they weren't necessarily you know completely on board with the players that we gave up. And that's part of almost all the decisions we make. Rarely will we have a unanimous group, um, and that's you know I like that. I like the fact that we're not all you know, reading from the same playbook, and we have that type of debate. But I think they all have tremendous ability, tremendous upside. And I think even, again, this is more me trying to self-reflect. Um, in the past, I think I would maybe get a little bit more caught up in, you know, who we're trading away. And I remember having a conversation with Billy Bean during the summer. Uh, and we just talked about trades and so on. And he told me that, look, I've traded tons of great players. And, you know, it's not so much worrying about who you're trading, it's what you're getting back. And if you're happy with what you're getting back, you know, it's part of the game. You know, you're trying to win every single trade, especially from our standpoint. Trading is a huge part of what we do. We try to stay out of the free agent market. And we don't ignore it entirely. But that, that trade avenue is a lifeline for us. And obviously scouting and player development is too. So, you know, we need trades to work out for the other clubs. And I think for the most part, we've had some, some pretty balanced deals that have worked out for both clubs. So... Um, you know, from that standpoint, I'm not overly concerned with it. I think we obviously think very highly of those players. It was hard to give them up. But at the same time, we're excited about the players we got back, and I think it's going to be a win-win for both clubs. As for, I've seen the reports, I've seen all kinds of reports that, uh, that I've heard on the radio the other day that players have the right to demand a trade after a year because they're traded in a multi-year contract. That's completely inaccurate. That was in two collective bargain agreements ago. That used to be a rule. Uh, that, that's no longer a rule. Um, I've heard that, you know, I've read things about Mark Burley and Pitbulls, and you know, we've already uh, talked to uh, his agent, I've talked to Mark, and we're actually trying to help him out with that, and he's going to work through that. Um, you know, that Josh Johnson uh, doesn't want to be here, he's very excited to be here. Um, I know his agent was on the radio, and but we talked afterwards, and I think his agent's excited for him to be here as well. So Jose Reyes is pretty excited to be here. I think it's normal that they would be shocked. Um, like everyone's written about, you sign a big free agent deal, very few big free agents get traded after one year. So that goes without saying. But I think once all the dust is settled, um, they realize they're coming to a team that has a chance to win. And I think that should be exciting for any of them. And we're going to do our best to make them feel welcome, and hopefully they'll be here for a long time. Gregor Chisholm again with MLB.com. Alex, uh, you've got potentially four major league caliber catchers uh, on your roster right now. Um, does this set you up for another trade, or what's your view at that position going forward now that you've got Buck, Aaron Sebia, Darno, Wilson as well? Sure. Um, you know, right now, I've talked to John Buck. You know, his position on the team would be the backup to J.P. Aaron Sebia. He understands that. Bobby Wilson someone that we claimed. He was an arbitration-eligible player. It would be a non-guaranteed deal. Um, someone that we've liked just from a backup standpoint. And you know, we claimed them just from a flexibility standpoint, not knowing what the offseason was going to bring. Um, you know, the, the Jeff Mathis, John Buck component, was actually the last part of this trade and it was actually held up the trade for about five or six hours at the end and before that it was Emilio Bonifacio being included that held up the trade as well so um, you know when we have depth we'll certainly if we can if we can get better in some other areas I touched on the areas I think we still can improve on you know if we have to use the surplus depth but I think um, you know I've read reports of that we're shopping players and this and that I mean right now Aaron CB is our starter. Buck is the backup. Travis Darno, who we think is a wonderful prospect, is coming back off an injury, has not had a full season at the AAA level at this point. We just want to see him get back, you know, have a, hopefully a good spring training, go down to the minor leagues, uh, get his swing back, and, and we'll worry about him hopefully uh, when he's having a great year down there and he can make the decision hard for us. So, um, you know, really things beyond that and people being shopped and so on. Like a lot of other reports you guys saw with the manager, completely false. Uh, Bruce, Bruce Arthur from the National Post. Given that you've put an unprecedented influx of payroll into this team, given that you know now that expectations in the city have been raised, uh, and given that you don't know what's going to unfold in the rest of the offseason, are you comfortable right now, if you had to break camp with this team, are you comfortable this team is a contender in the American League East and in baseball? I am, but you always 
I always, I, I like to worry, and um, I, I just I don't like to feel comfortable. I don't. Um, I just think it keeps you on your toes. So you know, right now I feel good about the team, but I'm. You're not going to hear me making any uh, grand statements about you know, how much better we are. And so I think we're. I think we're better. Obviously, we added a lot of talent, um, but we've seen what, what's happened. Oakland and Baltimore is two uh, great examples of what can happen. But um, I just think we always have to constantly look to get better, no matter how well we're hopefully playing. Uh, that isn't going to stop. But you know, I think right now we can have a very competitive team and a team that, that can contend right now. Um, you know, and obviously everyone's going to say the same thing, the caveats of health. We need to make sure we stay healthy, and that was certainly an example th this past year. But assuming health and players play to their abilities, I would see us being a contending team, but that doesn't mean that we're flawless, and it doesn't mean that there's not a lot of areas that we, we still can improve. Sheldon, uh, Drew Fairservice from the Score Digital. Uh, Jose Reyes, Melky Cabrera, switch hitters, Bonifacio, uh, Asturias, guys who can play multiple positions. Is this kind of flexibility, was that a concerted effort or was this just good players that ended up on the radar? Combination of both. Um, you know, I, again, I'm not, um, you know, some, something that I, I, I remember, I always like to read a lot of interviews from executives that have had that success or so on and um, something that, I remember Pat Gillick had said in one of his interviews that if you can get a player that brings something else, whether it's a clubhouse component, can make a player better. He always said he was always willing to pay a little bit more for those guys. And you know, guys like Reyes and Bonifacio, and even a guy like Bonifacio, um, you know, again, he was hurt last year, had a down year. But the work we did on those guys, the energy level that they brought and what they brought to their teammates, uh, I was really drawn to them. And, you know, you see um, the energy level and how important it is uh, for a team, how long how long the year is and what those guys bring to the clubhouse and what they bring to their teammates. And um, it's funny, I remember speaking to Pat in the off season after they, they acquired Pence and I asked him about that. You know, can you have too many high energy guys and so on and you know, the importance of it and, and he said he didn't feel like he did. But I'd say that, that was pretty important. The fact that you can create that depth and we saw what happened this past year with having to call up so many young players the flexibility to have that deep bench, to be able to move guys around, switch hit. Um, I love the speed contact combination. Obviously, if you put the ball in play and can run, a lot of good things can happen. You can force some errors. You can do a lot of things. You know, we obviously struck out a ton last year, and I think we improved. We're going to improve in that area. We've always had power, and I think from a defensive standpoint, uh, it's going to help our rotation and our bullpen as well when we can catch the ball at a little bit higher clip than we did last year. So. The tools are there, the ability of the players is there, and I, I think there was definitely an appeal to the flexibility and all the other things that those guys brought. John Stoddard from uh, CHCH TV. Last time you were here, there was a couple of harsh notes, some uh, hints about uh, tension and controversy in the clubhouse. Did that experience change you at all as a manager? And if so, what's different this time? Well, yeah, I had, yeah, I had a couple dust-ups. You know, it was Shea Hillenbrand and, and the, the Ted, Ted Lilly thing. And, and uh, you know, you, First of all, we're, I mean, we're in the entertainment business. This is a, I mean, families come out here to watch baseball games. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, you're seeing everything, you, you're seeing everywhere. And there's really no room for physical, I mean, to get physical with it. I mean, that's just, I mean, that shouldn't happen. Um, you know, that was, that was kind of a black eye for me. I mean, the, you know, the organization didn't look real well after that. But, um, you know, so plus I'm too old to be getting physical anyway with guys. But no, in in all seriousness, I mean, it, I wish it hadn't happened. It happened. But one thing I will say, you know, I'm I'm an intense guy. You know, I I, I, pl I play to win. Uh, you know, I've all I I grew up. I was raised, whether it's you know from my father from in athletics down in Texas, whatever it was. You know, you confront things head on, good or bad. You know, but. You still, I mean, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. So, um, yeah, I, I regret that happened. I mean, it, it really didn't show who I was as, as an individual. But, you know, I, you make your bed, you sleep in it. And, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate. And I, but also, I also believe you have to, you know, everybody's got to be pulling in the same direction. I mean, you, got, I mean if you're going to, you can have all the talent in the world. I mean, if, you, if they don't come together as a team and everybody's got their goals and their eyes set on one thing, that's, that's to win, be a champion. And you know you're gonna have, you can have all, it, as much talent as you want, but it's it's you're probably gonna come up short. I mean, you, talent is gonna get you to a certain point, but so there's something to be said for that. So, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't expect any problems. I, I 
very rarely had any problems in my career doing those things. Those were isolated incidents. But, you know, at this level, and they were unfortunate, but, you know, I think we moved on past that. You know, they, that ultimately didn't lead to my firing back then. I mean, it was a couple years later that I got that. And, and uh, I think we actually played our best baseball after those incidents, you know. So does that uh, give you the green light for that? No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, you know, you, you get my point. I actually, actually on that, and you know, we've we've talked about that, and you know, he's, you know, he talks, he feels he was a black guy, I was embarrassed. I, I don't have a problem with it. I actually looked at it as a strong point. Um, the reason being that you know, with what happened with Shea Hillenbrand, I mean, he better be be confronted. And I think it's sometimes, it, I think a manager at times it needs to be done in front of his teammates. And I don't know any other way to to deal with that. Um, and I know obviously it, it didn't reflect who he was, but I, I think it's a strong suit that. We know he's a great guy and he's easy to play for, but you know if you push, he will react. And I mean, I remember David Wells throwing the ball down the left field foul line with Cito Gaston, and Cito pinned him up against the wall. And David Wells is a big man, so it happens. We've seen Lou, Lou Pinella do that. You don't want it to happen, but I think there are times if if um, you know there there are times that that's happened in this game, and it's it's not something that that defines him, but. I think it also shows that if you do push and he has to react, he, he will react, and I think it's important. Alex, you've always been one to, to give people second chances, so I want to ask you about Melky and the risks involved in, in what he's gone through. And Gibby, you, you saw him hit in Kansas City. Maybe you, you saw his transition from what he was as a Yankee to what he became over the last couple of years. So maybe both of you on that. Sure. I mean, we did a lot of work on him, obviously. With the suspension, I mean, that was something that was very important uh, to look into. Um, talk to a lot of, uh, you know, the teams that he, he was on, front office, teammates, staff. Everyone had great things to say about him. Obviously, no one would, would condone what happened and what he did. And obviously, those are questions that I had when we were negotiating with him. And I, I was satisfied with the answers. And you guys will have a chance uh, to talk to him about it. I think, you know, the thought right now would be that, you know, spring training, it'll be addressed once, and that'll be the end of it, and we'll turn the page. But... Uh, we asked those questions, and it was part of it. But um, there's been a lot of guys in this game that have gotten a second chance, whether it was Giambi, whether it was Pettit, whether it was Brian Roberts. Um, again, no one condones it, but people have been given a second chance, and we did as much work as we could on the player. We obviously think he can help us win games. But more importantly, before he's actually a great teammate, and he's a great guy, and obviously he made a terrible mistake. And it's not something that anybody would condone or be, be proud of. But I've said this before. We will give someone a second chance. I don't think you'll see us give guys third or fourth. Yeah, I can remember watching Melky, this is like most of you, back in New York, you know, when he was a young kid first coming up. And, you know, you look back on their lineup back then and, you you know, you were looking for a little breathing room. You know, you get to a spot in their lineup, maybe, hey, hey here's, your, here's your out, you know. And, and Melky was the guy in the lineup. You thought, you know what, maybe the, he's, he's a young guy. I mean, the other heavyweights in there, you know. But he wasn't. I mean, he, he, was just, he was a very, very tough out back then. Uh, and, you know, he had that knack. He seemed to, you know, get a big hit when you need it. Not always. Nobody does. But, I mean, he was always in the, in the middle of things. I mean, that's what kind of st sticks out with me. Then I went to um, Kansas City a couple years ago. And he had, he had recently been – well, he, the year before he was traded to Atlanta. I heard when he went to Atlanta, he might have shown up a little bit overweight in the, you know, what I got in the doghouse, whatever, whatever happened. But we ended up picking him up the following year. You know, he, he comes to camp. You know, and, and I fell in love with the kid. You know, he's, uh, he, he, does, he doesn't say a whole lot. But you know what? He's got some kind of energy. I mean, he's, 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 he's smiling all the time. He, he, he brings energy, you know, and he's a good, he's a good player, and he's a, real, he's a real good hitter. You know, it's unfortunate what happened, but he's still a good hitter, you know, on the stuff or not. Um, and it was, you know, that, that first day, that year in Kansas City, I think he had over 200 hits. He stole, he stole some bases. You know, he, he played center field there for us, I mean, in a big, big center field. So ideally, that's probably not his spot. I think he could play here if he had to. He was a little smaller. But uh, ideal type left fielder, he can, he can really throw. He can do th – I mean, the, he's gonna, the fans are going to fall in love with the kid just by the way he approaches it, the way he shows up every day to play. And, you know, he's pretty darn good. Griffin, star, one more time. Um, a question for each. Gibby, um, who are your managerial role models and how – how many wins and losses do you think a manager can affect? And Alex, did the final week of the season af affect you in terms of looking for a hard ass like Gibby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he isn't a hard ass. And I, I think it's um, people that didn't know him after he left and went to Kansas City. I think 
you know, they looked at the Hill and Brand Ted Lilly thing, and and we all, everyone that knows him, and obviously a lot of people in this room know him. That, that's not who he is. Um, so, Gibby's. If you can't play for Gibby, I don't think you can play for too too many guys. And I've talked to a lot of former players that have had him, and um, everyone has great things to say. And players love playing for him. And I always saw the respect level from the players uh, when it came to John. And he just he treated them fairly, but they knew where they stood. He gave them a lot of rope. Uh, I know that everybody on his staff loved to work for him. Um, but now the final week of the season, I, I didn't go into it that, that way. I think just, one, no one wants to win 73 games. Um, I remember we had a town hall meeting with the organization at the end of the season. And I just, you know, Paul speaks and Steve Brooks speaks and I had to speak. And I just told everybody, I, I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to go through what we went through in 2012. And I know I can't guarantee it, but I did not have a lot of fun. And um, I'm, always, I'm always motivated and driven to put a good product out in the field. And our staff certainly is as well. But uh, more than ever, I remember just saying, I'm a big believer everything does happen for a reason one way or the other. Big believer in that. Um, and that's, I just think, with my, my life, a lot of things have worked out that way. Some, some tough times that I've had have led to some good times down the road. And I remember a lot of times talking to our staff during the summer saying, why is everything that can go wrong going wrong, even when it comes to the roof? I mean, it was just one, one, one after the other. And I do, do believe everything happens for a reason, and I think that's why we're sitting here today, and uh, things are, we feel are starting to fall, in, fall into place. Yeah, is uh, you know the, the there's a couple managers that I came in contact with. Um, you know, I played briefly in New York in the mid '80s, and, and Davey Johnson was a manager there. And, and I, and matter of fact, Dave's from my hometown. But uh, I just love the way he did, did things. You know, I mean, and his record speaks for itself. I mean, he uh, everywhere he goes, he wins. Granted, I mean, he he's, he's played, he's, he's managed some pretty good teams, but he gets the most out of his guys. Uh, and I think that what I really liked about him, or what stood out to me, is how, how confident he was. He didn't—he didn't talk a lot, you know. He—he—he he, he was a very confident guy, builds you up, and he expected results, you know. And, and he stuck—he stuck with you through thick or thin, to give you a chance, give yourself a chance, especially if you're a young guy to establish yourself. And I think he's got to be one of the best at doing that. And I mean, he's, he's very, very, very smart. The other guy I ran into in the in the Mets system when I got into coaching was Daryl Johnson, DJ. You know, he managed uh, the Red Sox back there in the mid '70s, and then. A little bit with Seattle, and DJ used to go around and you know talk to the coaches and minor league managers and kind of just talk about the game and things like that. And uh, so those are the two guys I, I really you know was in contact with, and, and uh, very impressive. I thought both the guys were very impressive, and, and they've they've uh, you know had had, inf had some influence on me anyway. As far as how many games manager, I don't know. You tell me. What do you think? <laughs> I'll tell you if I agree with you. <laughs> I do. Okay, that's a all right. So then you should not object to this hiring because it shouldn't matter any one way or the other, right? <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you, Griff. Somewhat. Gibby Wilner again. Um, you talked about Melky a little bit. Do you see him? I know it's early, but do you see him as like a two hitter or more of a middle of the order guy? And did you have Reyes at all when you were managing in the Mets system? And a three-part question. The third part is that a lot of people are asking, a lot of people want to know, is this your dream job? <laughs> <laughs> Should I save that one for last? No, uh, you know, Reyes, when, you know, I was managing the Mets system. He was, he was down to low minors. You know, I, heard, I had heard all about him. You know, he was the next... <laughs> Next true great player they thought kind of was going to come through New York, and, and, uh, and you know what, he's, he's done just that. He's, he's turning in a heck of a career. Um, as, far, as far as Melky, you know, I like Melky at the top of the order and just set the table for those guys in the middle. He's such a good hitter. He gets a lot of hits. You know, I mean, you could hit him in the middle, and he'll drive and runs, but I think he's been most productive if you buy into that or not up top. So I think he fits there. You know, I mean, it's too early to say who's going to hit where, but I would – you know, you pay, Alex paid a lot of money for him to come over to the hit, so we want to get we want to get as many at bats as we can. And dream jobs, I I don't know how you could not like this job, but you know, I to be honest, I got to say my dream job. I had it last year in San Antonio, Texas, in my hometown. Didn't go too well, but I got a chance to live at home. But I left that job for this one, so that I'll tell you something. Yeah.
Uh, Gregor Chisholm with MLB.com again. Uh, Gibby th with Reyes, Bonifacio, Lori, uh, guys like Rajay Davis. There's a lot of speed in this lineup, probably the most that you've had before uh, at the big league level at least. What do you think that does for the lineup? And I think I remember you being kind of a proponent of the hit and run, but how do you plan on utilizing that speed next year? Well, yeah, I mean, that's extreme speed, these guys. I mean, they can, they can uh, make things happen. They've proven that over, over their career. And, um, you know, it gives you, that, it gives you that big weapon. I mean, certain guys in baseball, when they get on base, it's tough to stop them. And sometimes, you know, you can't stop them, depending on what you have on the mound or what you got behind the plate catching. So, uh, you know, anytime you can steal a base and get in a scoring position, you know, a lot more, there's a lot more singles hit than extra base hits. You know, but in saying that, you also got to be smart. I, I don't believe you, you run – stupidly and, and, and make stupid outs and uh, especially when you have the guys hitting in the middle that we're going to have that are proven home run hitters and, and RBI guys you know you, you don't uh, I mean it doesn't mean you shut things down I mean you're going to get thrown out sometimes but let's, let's let's also be smart about it and those guys are getting paid a lot of money to do their thing and, and those guys can deliver instant runs with one swing of the bat so I mean you got to be smart but yet it's, it's a big big weapon because you know it's tough to stop sometimes.